again, um, because of the large number of contracting states, don't assume that you're contracting with a uh, party from a state that would necessarily have this uh, benefit. Uh, international arbitration, institutional arbitration is provided by the International uh, Chamber of Commerce in Paris, the International Center for Dispute Resolution, which is uh, basically the American Arbitration Association's international wing, the London Court of uh, International Arbitration, and so on and so forth. Uh, the uh, World Intellectual Property uh, Organization Arbitration and Mediation Center is uh, uh, very well known and specialized in IP disputes. Uh, uh, and then there's ad hoc arbitration and uh, the uh, UN Central Model Law on International Commercial Arbitration is often used for that. Uh, IP exception, and this is really the most important part of uh, the slide. Um, when you agree to arbitration, international arbitration, reserve, if you're a licensor, but it's also uh, in most transactions, both parties are licensors to some extent or the other. Um, for licensors particularly, expressly reserve rights to access courts to protect your intellectual property. If you bundle that into the arbitration as final and binding, then you might find yourself a little bit out of luck to go to the courts. And sometimes it's really important to go to the national courts in the foreign jurisdiction because you need an immediate injunction. And injunctions and interim relief in an arbitration scenario, even the, the fastest uh, interim relief that's granted, and that's by the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, is usually one week. They appoint the arbitrator within 24 hours, but then it's still about a week to get that interim relief. Uh, whereas if you go to court, and in India too, you can usually get it between 48 and 72 hours, which is much better than a week. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, arbitration and the award from the arbitration is limited to the parties, to the arbitration agreement. So in uh, intellectual property disputes, you will find um, as an IP owner, when your intellectual property rights have been abused or disclosed, trade secrets have been disclosed, there is a third party involved in there. And uh, arbitration is not the forum which would uh, permit uh, uh, IP dispute resolution with respect <coughs> to the third party. In those cases, you want to be able to go straight <coughs> to the courts. The other um, reason why you want to keep an IP exception is uh, ex parte relief may be necessary if there's bad faith. Uh, the New York Convention Article 51B requires notice and opportunity to consent from the other party, and when there's bad faith involved, you just want to go and get the order. Um, so for all of these reasons, you know, you, uh, licensors, intellectual property owners, <coughs> reserve uh, the right to go to any court uh, with competent jurisdiction uh, to protect their intellectual property <coughs> with confidential information. It doesn't mean that you can't use the arbitration forum still to arbitrate on your IP disputes. You can still use it, but the exception essentially permits you if you want and you change your mind and you want to go through a faster route that you can go and get that protection. Uh, <coughs> local and foreign counsel should be consulted to select the appropriate arbitration forum, the rules, and the venue for the contract. These are very, very important clauses, and it can alter, not handling them properly, can alter and create uh, literally a pain in the neck and delays uh, at, at the time the dispute results. Express provisions wedded by local and foreign counsel should be included in the contract to address arbitration. Finally, uh, choice of law. Most jurisdictions respect the choice of law selected by parties to a private contract, including India and the US, uh, but you still want to expressly include conflicts of, uh, ex expressly exclude conflicts of law principles that would change the parties' choice of law selection. Uh, in India, US transactions, <coughs> what I have found is uh, typically uh, US federal law and New York state law is, uh, is chosen as a law of contract. Uh, sometimes, uh, English law is also accepted, but that's much, much more rare. Um, caveats to the choice of law selection by the parties. Um, certain foreign local laws will still apply to the terms of the contract. For example, export control laws, you know, foreign corrupt practices and anti-corruption laws, IP laws, uh, when it comes to you know, where the IP has been created and therefore you want to look at the national jurisdiction and how the presumptions <coughs> apply. Uh, antitrust and competition laws would still apply. 
Uh, typical, uh, typically, the following types of contracts will be subject to foreign local law, even if you choose uh, your, a different law in the contract. <coughs> Uh, contracts between local parties. So if you are a U.S. company and you have an Indian subsidiary and the Indian subsidiary enters into a contract with another Indian company, it's Indian law that will govern that relationship. Um, if you have a distributor uh, in, a, you know, in a jurisdiction, again, the distributor's relationships with other distributors and consumers would be governed by the local law. Uh, contracts with governmental entities. There, more often than not, you know, you, you have to accept the law that's uh, insisted upon by the governmental entity. Uh, contracts with consumers and individuals. Uh, a lot of countries, uh, because they want to protect individuals and their consumers, uh, will uh, override any uh, different choice of law from their national laws in order to protect their consumers. Uh, finally, on choice of law, uh, this is actually rather important. Uh, it's really important to exclude the UN Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods. Uh, the UN CISG <coughs> essentially will apply in the context of IP when you have licenses involving international sale of goods and software and be a good. The definition of good in the uh, UN CISG is uh, more of uh, an exclusion, exclusive, uh, ex exclusionary definition. So it doesn't exclude software, uh, and therefore, by definition, it would be included. It may be included. The uh, UNCISG applies to contract <coughs> contracts for the sale of goods between parties from countries that are signatories to that international um, uh, convention. The U.S. is a signatory. India is not. Very wise thing that India did. But that does not mean that you shouldn't be worried about that. Uh, and that's because it may be implicated if you are entering into a contract with a U.S. company and you have your U.S. affiliate enter into that contract, uh, but the goods are moving from India to the U.S. Or if uh, you have another affiliate in the U.K. or, well, not the U.K., but a different jurisdiction because the U.K. also has not accepted that uh, convention. But, you know, keep in mind there are these oddities and uh, you just have to keep your eyes open. Uh, and, and the convention is, is not really favorable from, uh, from a contracting <coughs> party standpoint, at, at least uh, that's what I would think, because it permits parole evidence, which is essentially you can look outside of the contract to see what was to, to interpret what should be the relationship of the parties, uh, and there are other atypical provisions. So in conclusion, um, I would say you know, cross-border licensing transactions involve a complex interplay of national and international laws and many pitfalls for the unwary. Uh, you know, Mr. Stoll talked uh, and his team was about certainty. There's a lot of certainty, believe me, in a lot of national jurisdictions. The only thing is you shouldn't assume anything about that certainty because you just don't know what it might be in those jurisdictions. So you have to be really careful and uh, you know, having practiced in this field for several years, I, when I talk to foreign counsel, every day I learn uh, what are the other things you've got to keep your eyes open for. Uh, business IP and legal due diligence is paramount in achieving transaction success and adequate time should be allotted for that. Licensors and licensees uh, should each work with counsel in the countries in which they're planning to do business. So if you are an Indian company looking to do business outside India, don't just rely on your local counsel. Make sure your local counsel is talking to counsel in that foreign jurisdiction. And make sure that you ask questions as who all are involved from the foreign council's team? What do they, you know, are they covering bankruptcy? Are they covering tax issues, corporate issues, and IP? Is there an IP specialist there? You need to ask those questions because not always, uh, you know, all council, all the right people are, are, are brought together to get the transaction through. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you.